Hello YouTube and welcome to Vintage Airways, where we're going to be making airlines great again, or once great airlines great again. Actually, the, this is going to be probably my penultimate FS Passenger series of videos. I have one series planned beyond this, and after that, all future similar type content will be done in X-Plane 11 with a product that I'm currently in the process of developing. Actually, the reason why I've sat back and had time to do this series is uh, the laptop that I normally use for development purposes is off being repaired for a week. So I'll have that back next week. In the meantime, I get to sit around and do a little extra flight simming. Additionally, during this, we're going to be talking about payware add-ons of classic airliners that we I will be using throughout the series. So it'll be a little bit of a review of those products, as well as we're going to be talking about the history of the aircraft uh, for those videos, it'll probably be two or three videos in each one of these aircraft, maybe at times talking about different airlines that flew the same aircraft, as well as the history of those airlines, many of which are defunct. Now, today we're going to be starting the Texas Triangle and talking about the origins of Southwest Airlines along with the Boeing 732. Now, this being the first video in the series, I'm going to probably talk more extensively about the Captain Sen. 732 7, or uh, 737-200, otherwise known as the 732, as well as discussing extensively the history of the aircraft itself and talking a little bit about Southwest, but I'll probably leave the Southwest commentary to the next video. Part of this is also the fact that I need to get some images off my phone onto my Windows-based PCs uh, from photos that I took at the Aviation Museum a couple of weeks ago. I uh, was down at Dallas, Texas, at Dallas Love Fields at the Frontiers of Flight. I believe that's the name of the aviation museum there at Love Field. Uh, it was kind of an interesting time. Uh, it, well, an interesting museum. And they have a little bit of the different sections to the different carriers that are coming in there. And there's a lot of stuff to talk about with Southwest, with Love Field, where we're flying out of today, and the Wright Amendment and a lot of things there. There's a lot of interesting aviation history, and that's part of the reason of why I want to do this particular series of videos, and I've been wanting to do it for a while. I've just finally sat down and found the time to do it. Now, for this video series, it is more than less likely that the vast majority of it will be spent uh, doing commentary and stuff like that in post-production, as I am doing here. Uh, so hopefully the quality will be a little bit better. That being said, probably the last flight with each of these aircraft I will do live over Twitch. Uh, keep in mind that I will probably be streaming those on Friday afternoons uh, around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock U.S. Central. The time might be a little bit different because I have usually a Friday afternoon or Friday morning conference call for work that usually ends about one o'clock and I may go grab something to eat shortly after that and come and do this series. Uh, also after this, another eight and a half months, I nine months, I don't expect that I'm gonna have as much time to do YouTube videos for a while. So trying to get a lot of content done and probably my ultimate FS passenger series will come out sometime next year, uh, but I will have shot it months ahead of time uh, as we're going through doing this. So this is the Captain Sem 737-200. It is available oh once a year on sale for 10 bucks. I picked this up this year. Uh, last year I picked up the 727, 707, and a whole bunch of other aircraft that they offer. And at $10 a pop, it's a pretty reasonable price to pay for this add-on. It's a few years old, but it still looks pretty good, and in terms of systems, modeling, and functionality, while not a study-level aircraft, I consider this to be almost an intermediate level, or an intermediate plus level, where it is somewhere between just a few more switches in the cockpit that do things uh, that I usually classically define as an intermediate level, and a full-out study sim. I believe that the Flying J Sim for the X Plane 10 is a little bit more closer to the uh, uh, study sim category. That being said, don't take anything that I'm doing here as how you would actually start this aircraft in real world. This is literally my first attempt, and 
trying to figure out where everything is. I kind of have a basic idea, general idea from flying the default 737s and the common Boeing flight deck hasn't changed that much, although this design predates that a little bit. And you can start to see that the basic design philosophy hasn't changed much, uh, even if the instrumentation has. And this is just me kind of more or less knowing what the systems do in a general sense of the term of, oh, well, you need bleed air on. Now, it doesn't offer some things like ground uh, services and stuff like that. You can open the various doors on the aircraft, like the APU shield in the back of the aircraft, uh, different various service doors, but it doesn't necessarily have the accompanying ground service equipment. You do, interestingly enough, have the option of connecting to ground power as well as ground bleed air, which was a requirement for the 707 and for early jet aircraft to have those services available at an airport to be able to fly in and out of there. One of the things that made the 737-200 as well as the 727, and we'll talk a little bit more about that aircraft later, very attractive to a lot of these airlines was it did have an integrated APU or auxiliary power unit that meant that this aircraft as well as the 727 could operate from smaller airports that didn't have those services available. In fact, the 737-200, like the 727, featured integrated air stairs, meaning it could operate from airports that maybe didn't have an air stair truck or lacked jetways for passengers embark and disembarking. So it made it very advantageous to fly this aircraft in particular into smaller airports. And that was kind of the crux of Southwest Airlines core strategy. They flew and started flying out of Dallas at Love Field to Houston Hobby Airport and to San Antonio. That was the three legs of the Texas Triangle and today's leg will be Dallas over to Houston. Second leg will be over to San Antonio and San Antonio then back to Dallas. Interestingly enough, the 737-200 was really designed for these short flights that today would be covered usually by either a turboprop or increasingly a small regional commuter jet such as the CRJ-200 or the CRJ-700 or the Embraer 135 or Embraer 145 and the modern day replacement for those being like the Embraer 175 uh, would be the aircraft again Original configuration of the 737-100, which was only purchased and used extensively by Lufthansa, which was the launch customer, I believe has seating for around 94, a little bit around 100 uh, for these type of flights. However, the most produced variant was the 737-200, which was a stretched version that could haul up to 136 passengers in a single economy style seating arrangement usually around 115 to 118, I'd say 115 to 120, with a typical two-class configuration as we were using today, which is a little bit blasphemous because, uh, of course, Southwest has never had multiple classes. They've had offered a single-class service throughout their history, where basically it's all coach, or this day and age, what used to be coach would almost be considered to be coach plus, uh, or premium economy, I think, is the, the new term uh, for the seat angles, side width, and all of those things that uh, increasingly you find on other airlines. Now, I will say that this is the toughest aircraft that I've had to deal with taxiing on the ground, and after I finished with this flight, I think I figured out why. Most other aircraft, even Captain Sim aircraft that I fly in... Uh, FSX, nose wheel, nose wheel steering is linked to rudder paddles and, and rudder control. You don't specifically usually have to turn on nose wheel steering, but I noticed with this aircraft it had a definite lack of it, especially after landing uh, and going back and viewing the replays. So this is what it's like to try to turn a 732 without using nose wheel steering. Now, I've got to go through and look at key binding controls and stuff like that, but that's normally not something that I have to key bind uh, whether or not to enable or disable that. But you can see here we're making some pretty wide turns. That being said, it looks like the wheel itself is turning because you can tell with the landing light or the taxi light there 
that it is moving, the wheel should be moving. At the same time, it seems to be very sluggish. I don't know if this is a something that is indicative of the 732. I don't recall it being that way in X-Plane 11, of course. Different simulation, different product by different company. But uh, that is one thing that I've noticed that is pretty challenging. And as a general rule, now granted, I haven't gone through and read the documentation on how to use the equipment. I probably need to go through and find a YouTube how-to video on the autopilot for this system because I haven't quite figured it out. Uh, I have with the 727. I've logged enough uh, hours in that over the past six months, a year. But uh, yeah, we're off to a little bit of an iffy start here as I look down and wasn't quite straight with the runway there. Uh, foot was on the rudder pedal a little bit more than I had anticipated. But the 732 was powered by the JT-8D, which is the engine that I will probably talk about a lot in future videos. As this is the engine that ushered in the jet commercial aviation age, at least within the United States. Uh, it is this engine that is found on the 732, the 727, and the DC-9. All product and designs of the late 50s and early 1960s. An engine that was used primarily for aircraft that were on short and medium haul routes. Again, this would be air, these would be aircraft today that would be operating on routes serviced by regional jets more often than not. Now, interestingly enough, due to not really understanding some of the ins and outs of the autopilot system, I am actually hand flying for most of this flight. And with it being about 55 minutes, uh, they estimated in time route to be about 28 minutes, and then I added basically 20 minutes onto that uh, to account for ground time and taxi time on the ground between. Uh, both Love Field, which wasn't that extensive, and Houston Hobby, including any traffic for go-arounds or anything like that that we had to do. It's always a good idea to pad 20-30 minutes. I usually basically think I'm going to spend 20 minutes on the ground no matter where I'm flying to, and then I usually build in a buffer of 10 minutes per hour, estimated hour of flight time on top of that. If it's going to be a less than an hour, I just build in that 20 minutes. If I think it's going to be a two-hour flight, then I usually build in 30 minutes. If it's going to be a three-hour flight, I tend to try to build in about 30 to 40 minutes as well. So there is kind of a maximum limit there of where it no longer makes sense to do in uh, FS passengers. But we're climbing out here, and I'm going to go ahead and speed up the video in the background at this point. So one thing I don't like about the Captain Sim 732 product, and some of this is personal preference, is I would prefer to be about five or six inches back uh, perspective-wise to get a better overview over all of the instrumentation uh, and still be able to see out. I know that if you're purely going to be instrument flying, for instance, you know that would be a that would be considered to be bad habit uh, and things of that nature. But for the flight sim experience, I, I would kind of like that. I know I could go in and edit text files for the camera angles in the aircraft config, I or buy a product like EasyDock uh, that would allow me to do something very similar to that. But uh, yeah, this is one of those things that I wish was kind of there, but it's a minor nitpick thing. Uh, I know that other people are going to disagree with me and be absolutely fine where the camera placement is for right now. That's just a personal thing. Overall, I do like the sounds, and a couple of test flights, or not really test flights, but in previous flights and stuff like that, I have noticed that the sound library sometimes gets confused too. Uh, like one time I was climbing, and the altitude alert would just not stop going off. The altitude alert sign wasn't on, so I couldn't disable it. It was a bug, and it was annoying. And there's been a couple of other alerts like that, that instead of stopping when they're supposed to, uh, they'll just continue. They get basically locked into a loop for whatever reason. And that can be extremely irritating. It didn't happen on this flight, uh, but it happened to me whenever I was setting up controls several months ago, right after I had just purchased the product and was just taking off to see if things and the alerts, I remember, just would not shut off. And it was eventually just about giving me a headache. Uh, it was that annoying. So something else to kind of keep in mind, it may not necessarily be completely bug-free. 
So we're going to have to get up to 29,000 feet, and I am using the autopilot in order to control the heading of the aircraft, but pitch and climb and all of that is a combination of trying to trim it out as well as holding the yoke. And frankly, with off-the-shelf, uh, just, you know, $100 flight sim yoke, I found it very difficult to trim out aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator to the right point. Uh, it seems like it happens in steps, and sometimes you need a quarter of a step or a half a step, and there just programmically isn't that option available for an aircraft. And this is one of those aircraft where I had an immense number of challenges trying to get the aircraft uh, to fly straight and level without using autopilot necessarily. And in this aircraft, there is no auto throttle, there is no autopilot control of descent or ascent or vertical speed rather. I think is the better way of putting that, ascent and descent. So I'm having to do all of that manually with either the flight controls or through trimming the aircraft for climb, for level flight, for descent, and all of those things. So kind of keep that in mind. We're getting pretty close to altitude as I'm holding it, trying to hold it steady at about 2,500 feet per minute. Also keeping an eye on the airspeed indicator as well. Make sure not to start to lose too much airspeed and thus cause a stall not paying attention. So a couple of things on that and then I'm gonna go ahead and speed it up here to 8x whenever I turn on from 4x to 8x and post-production when I turn on altitude hold here and I think I will continue to do this for cruise sections of the flight. Let me know how I should handle remainder cruise sections. Should I speed it up 8 maybe even 16x in order to cut down on the length of video, especially on longer flights, if nothing dramatic happens, such as a, a hijacking or a flight in-flight failure of some kind or something of that nature. Uh, let me know in the comment section down below how you want me to handle that in future episodes. Now keep in mind, it may take two or three episodes before those changes take effect. Generally, I shoot two or three episodes at, you know, one time and have them ready or ahead of time and have them ready to go. So it's one of those things that first couple of videos may not quite be there, but from thereafter they should be. But let me know your thoughts and suggestions in the comment section down below. So we got our orders for to descend and for runway I believe on 12 right uh, for an ILS approach. And again, I probably need to go look at a YouTube video on how to use the ILS system on this aircraft. I thought it was going to be similar to the 727. And I got something wrong, either that or lined up something wrong because strange things happen. But my meantime, continuing basically manual descent, trying to hold it at about 2,500, 3,000 feet per minute uh, descent rate. I need to look up and see what it officially is, uh, the usual descent rates uh, for actual commercial airlines and airline policies and stuff like that. I haven't bothered to ask any of my airline pilot friends what they normally descend at. I'm sure that I could go to forums or on Reddit and stuff like that and find that information pretty readily. I just haven't bothered to look it up. Uh, again, I tend to be, especially in FSX and for entertainment purposes, a far more casual simmer. I'm not one of the guys who are demanding that I would do everything that you should do as according to the procedures and the proper procedures and the flight instruction manual and the level D simulator and uh, how you should do it as a real world pilot because at the end of the day it is a computer program that is flawed with a control interface that while I enjoy it it is not the greatest in the world I would probably have a much better reaction with a joystick Although that being said, if I am going to be flying an Airbus, for instance, I'll hook up a T16000M to the left side of my cockpit area here and do that. I'm trying to find where our airport is. I know that runway is going to be 1 2, so pulling out just a little bit here as I've. We'll be slowing things back down for final approach to the normal video and video response time. But I'm trying to figure out where the airport is, and I'm like, we're going in the complete wrong direction. So I disable autopilot and uh, start turning her around and end up perfectly lined up with the runway here, surprisingly. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
go back to normal time and uh, let you hear it the rest of the way in. One thousand. Approaching minimums. Minimums. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. quick watch view from the replay view with the control tower with a nice view of the city skyline of Houston in the background although the video here gets a little bit choppy as you can tell I've forgotten to turn on my landing lights I was worried about so many other things didn't even think about it so yes points off for that so no landing lights on Didn't quite get the link wings level for touchdown. Did you see the reverse thrusters engage there as the aircraft goes down the runway? Although I don't recall it being this choppy in the replay, but could have just been the way that I was looking at things. We'll get uh, one more view here from another replay. So here we are back into the cockpit again and you'll see the problems I had with getting this plane to, to turn and it seems to me as though like the nose wheel isn't steering isn't engaged but I suppose it is because the wheel light moves I don't know it just seems to be a very particularly difficult aircraft to taxi in far as it has a very wide turning radius for me here as I uh, get permission to go to the gate and I will go ahead and, and speed it up once again. Now something else that I've noticed with the Captain Sim product is that the throttle is very touchy. It seems like you barely touch it and even at idle you're going 30 miles an hour and that just doesn't seem right for this aircraft. Seems like there should be more mass and inertia and I think that's another reason why between that and it just doesn't feel like nose wheel steering is engaged uh, even though I believe it's supposed to be. 
So yeah, that leads to some very tough steering issues with this aircraft on the ground for taxiing. But that's the end of the flight. We got our passengers pretty much on our destination within our 55 minute time window, uh, a couple of minutes late. Uh, we ended up with three quarters of a million SEM bucks for this. I mean, thanks to that nice 50x subsidy multiplier. Otherwise, real income of about 15,000. Uh, we got docked points for lights, but nothing major with, you know, G-forces or anything like that. Still in positive territory for uh, pilot points, so consider that to be very, very good. Uh, customers had a great flight. Uh, our touchdown speed was only uh, 33, uh, negative 33 feet per minute so that's a kiss very very smooth landing probably the smoothest landing I've ever done and well we've completed our first leg of the Texas Triangle from Dallas Love Field to Houston Hobby Airport and join us next time as we'll be flying on over to San Antonio and during that flight we'll be talking a little bit more about the 732 itself and the history of the airplane as well as a little bit about Southwest, although we'll probably get more into Southwest Airline in the final leg of the, our kind of trio of Southwest Gardnered flights from San Antonio on upwards to Dallas, Texas. So, thank you very much for watching. See you next time.